Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit of CynicalBrit.com and the YouTube channel Total Halibut, and I am here to talk a little bit about Kingdoms of Amalur. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? We'll talk a little bit about your upcoming game. Sure. Uh, my name is Sean Dunn. I'm the Studio General Manager at Big Huge Games and 38 Studios. Uh, and uh, we're currently working on Kingdoms, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. Now, Kingdom of Zama Law Reckoning is an open world RPG, and of course, the one and only Mighty Kurt Schilling, which some of you should have heard of, I would certainly hope, has said a great many interesting things about it. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the game in a nutshell? What's, what is it that you're trying to put together? Well, uh, what we're trying to do is we've built this massive open world RPG. It's a single player RPG. Um, and the premise of the game is uh, you begin the game uh, having just been resurrected through what's called the Well of Souls. Um, the Well of Souls is this magical resurrection device that was created by uh, one of the gnomes, former Hughes. Um, and you start out the game with a personal journey trying to figure out first uh, how you died, who killed you, um, and then why you were resurrected. Hmm. Uh, and then as you move on through that personal journey and move on through the main quest, uh, you also start to get a sense of the world journey that you're going through and the, and the, the part that you need to play in, in helping kind of uh, bring the world uh, through this war that is going on. Um, so that's kind of how it starts out. Yeah, the word destiny seems to crop up an awful lot when talking about the yeah. game, and also the words blank slate. Would you like Correct. to explain a little bit about the mechanics of how that actually works? Sure, excellent. So... Um, Basically, in this world, in Amalur, uh, all the creatures, all of the people within the world are tied through these threads of fate. They have preordained destinies. Now, when you're resurrected through the Well of Souls, you've been essentially ripped from those threads of fate. You don't have a destiny. So basically what that means is you get to craft your own destiny. You also have the ability to change the fates of others within the world. Now you can imagine in a world where everyone's fate is preordained that once they fi figure out there's someone that can actually change fates, the effect mm -hmm. that you have on the entire world. Yeah. Um, and people react to you in that manner as you move through uh, the storyline. Um, and the whole idea of destinies is really how we're trying to get around that idea of a class system in an mm -hmm. RPG. Yeah. Many times in an RPG, you're stuck choosing a class at the start of the game. You have no idea whether you enjoy playing that class course, in the yeah. game. You could get 15 hours down the line and find out that it sucks. It's just not for you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then have to restart. We didn't want that to happen. So uh, basically, every time you level up, you get points to put into different abilities. There mm -hmm. are three ability trees, the might, finesse, and sorcery trees, okay. essentially a warrior, a rogue, and a mage yep. tree. Yep. You can mix those any way you want to. Uh, and what the game will do is it will recognize the points that you're putting into the different trees and it will start to unlock different destinies for okay. you. So you could unlock a battle mage or a spell sword or if you mixed finesse and sorcery, a shadow caster. Okay. Uh, and essentially it gives um, some bonuses to certain uh, attributes. It can also even change the way that certain mechanics work in the game. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, warrior destinies, the, the dodge is a roll. Yep. And it has collision because warriors want to get in close to enemies yep. and be right in their face to smash okay. them in their faces. Right. Uh, mages don't want to be in people's faces. Not especially. No, wearing sandals and cloth, it's just not a great idea to get not smashed. Really. So uh, the, the mage gets a teleport. Now you can imagine what happens when you start to mix mage and finesse or rogue skills. You can teleport through an enemy. You're instantly behind them. Ah, which then follows up with, of course, stab in the back. Exactly. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And I think the one other thing that I'd like to mention, certainly, is that I heard there's a certain writer involved in the storyline of this. Would you like to tell people who that is? Absolutely. So, um, R.A. Salvatore, uh, he's, he's basically the creator of the 10,000 years of history of Amalur. So he's written this gigantic tome of information about all the races within the world, races that have died out to create this kind of backstory and ah, history for okay. the world. Um, he's really big on making sure that everything within the world has meaning. So if there are ruins in an area, it's not just because an artist thought it would look cool to have ruins. Yeah. There has to be a reason for them to be there. Mm -hmm. And then that spawns things like books about the history of that region that explains right. what that race was and how they died. 
Um, and that's really important for grounding the player within the property, within the world, and really giving them a sense of kind of belonging there. Um, so RA hasn't, he doesn't actually write the dialogue in the game. Okay. He's generated all of the story of the world, yeah. and then all of our designers and writers get to pull from that. That actually seems like a really great idea to hire a writer of sub stature, not just to write dialogue, because perhaps that is a little bit, a bit of a waste of the talents being just a script writer, actually creating a world where the story plays out and actually fully fleshing it out, which is something that games have started to do a little bit more right. recently, particularly EA games, of course, you know, Dragon Age, things like that with the Codex, Mass Effect, same kind of thing, trying to create this rich universe. So that sounds really great. And obviously we're gonna have to wrap this interview up very quickly because we're about to go and see the game, get hands on with it and see what's going on there. And then we'll perhaps follow up with some more detailed questions. Uh, the one last thing I would like to ask just so that people can get a good vision in their mind of of what exactly is going on with this game. Mm. I heard the words God of War married to Oblivion. Just how accurate is that? Uh, I'd say that's fairly accurate. And again, you'll have to get your hands on and tell me what you think. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we really take the, to heart the action combat um, and the open world nature of the game, being able to go wherever you want to go, do where whatever you want to do. You could skip quests completely if you wanted to, explore the entire world. Um, we really feel that that's, that's what an RPG player wants. They want that player choice. They want I the think choice they do. of being, doing whatever they want. And now we're also giving them combat that doesn't suck. So <laughs> instead combat. of avoiding uh, encounters, they want to actually engage in encounters. That is a fantastic subtitle as far as <laughs> of any game. King of the Reckoning, combat that doesn't suck. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tull Fiskett. Thank you very much for that. And we'll probably follow up after we've got hands on with some more detailed awesome. information. Keep an eye out for King of the Reckoning, folks. And we'll see you next time. Gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit of CynicalBrit.com and the YouTube channel Total Halibut, part two of our Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning interview. Indeed, we could call this interview The Reckoning. It would be wonderful. <laughs> and we're joining once again with big, huge games to talk about everything we have just seen, as much okay. as we can at any rate. And we have seen a lot. So, firstly, congratulations on actually marrying a really awesome combat system with an RPG, finally. Thank you very much. And... I believe that what we said in part one of the interview where we had this great quote that was God of War married with Oblivion. Yeah, what we've seen, that is actually pretty accurate. It really, really is. So try to think of a question I can marry to that without saying, this is awesome, guys. <laughs> That's not an interview question, John. You're going to have to sort that out. So, so walk me through the initial development process of the combat system. I want to know where the ideas came from, where the inspirations came from, Absolutely. and how it's developed up to get to this point. Well, um, initially, uh, the combat system was a little more traditional. Yep. Um, and uh, we were not happy with it. Uh, in fact, it stunk. So uh, moving into that kind of more action um, inspired combat just kept steamrolling into the necessity for more features to make that come to life. So um, an action combat system is not just fast attacks and animations. Uh, it deals with things like frame interrupts, uh, the ability to do parries and frame accurate dodging. Yeah, and we know it's like juggling that. as well, which I, I, was, I well. was gleeful <laughs> on that. Sort of thing. He's juggling him. That's yes. wonderful. Something that's uh, you know has inspired our combat team, our lead combat designer, Joe Codera, is actually uh, used to be a tournament Tekken player. Really? So, um, you know, that drive to have that accuracy, that responsiveness to the feel, um, you know, the animations that give those beautiful tells for the enemies. Yeah. Uh, even the combat design of the encounters where uh, you played some encounters where I there did. was a mix of uh, Etons uh, that had these wolves around them as well. Yeah. 
and uh, you know you learn to deal with those wolves quickly because they the it, when they start interrupting your attacks. Yes, yeah, so incredibly leaps, annoying. Yes. Yeah, you got to bring the wolves down first, otherwise you're not going to be able right. to deal with the Etans. Yeah. yeah, it's always nice to light them on fire and uh, watch them burn. <laughs> There you go, folks. You know, that's now on film. <laughs> Whatever the case, yeah, it was, it was a nice mixture. And those of you who have played God of War games, of course, Bayonetta, which was needless to say our number one game in the chart last year that we put out there, and deserves to be there as far as I'm concerned. And was also, as they said in there, a bit of an inspiration because you do have some finishing moves that are, let's just say, a little bit over the top. Absolutely. Uh, our, our animation team and our combat team just went to town with these. And then also with the inspiration of Todd McFarlane, um, he's all about over the top. And so he helped drive the team to really bring these big poses into the animations and these big, you know, you'd, you see even some of those kind of pregnant pauses at the top. Yeah, of an, leading up to lead something to this big. explosive, yeah. you know, surge of energy. Um, and, and that's been pervasive throughout, even not just the finishing moves, but the base animation chains, the combat chains that, that go on. Um, and it also helps with uh, enemy attacks. So it's really nice to give a language about combat. So you want enemies to give tells about what they're going to do so that the player can pick up on those things. Yeah, almost essential, I would say, in an action game, certainly. Absolutely. It has to happen. There is no way to play them otherwise. These games are called spectacle fighters for a reason they're very flashy but they're also about precision right it's not simply about button mashing especially at higher difficulty levels and one would assume that amalor will have that kind of challenge because you're you're appealing to the rpg market but right. there's no way it's not going to get interest from people that are also into spectacle fighters so they're going to want this big huge challenge as well they want yeah. absolute perfection and things like that so i assume you're going to be catering to that as well we do have dynamic difficulty levels you'll be able to change the difficulty level at any time um, something that's important about the combat though it's not just about the precision precision adds to your efficiency in the combat uh, a huge amount of your efficacy is about the choices that you make yeah. for your character the ability points that you put into your character, the loot that you equip, yep. the, the armor and the weapons. Um, you know, you were playing a warrior that yes, had, was. Uh, he had a, a, a long sword, which was a rather quick weapon, yep. and then a huge seven foot long great sword. It was rather fun. Which, <laughs> yes, it's got, uh, you know, and, and mixing those styles up is important, but also the choices of, you know, you saw, uh, some of the Etten shamans were immune to that lightning damage. Yeah, they were, so yeah. uh, you wanted to use that fire sword on them instead. Um, and it's really making those RPG choices that are really important, that idea of crowd control, you know, understanding the immunities and resistances that your enemies have. Yeah. Take down um, orders and things like that. Exactly. As you with the wolf exactly. and Etten combination. Right. And yeah. so it's that combination of, of both that strategic element that the traditional RPG player is more used to, and then the action stuff on top of it. And we don't require you to memorize these long combos of X, Y, X, Y, yeah. uh, things like that. It's all about rhythm and timing. And as you build up your character, you're really building up the the complexity of those attack chains. And so you start with a more simple um, entry into uh, your weapon attacks. And then as you level your character, as you put points into those weapon skills, you build that complexity and you gain this mastery as you play. Yeah, so I would like to talk a little bit about the Destinies actually because we did see them. And I also noticed the somewhat unusual idea that if you do what would in other RPGs make things go horribly wrong for you, which is, I'm just going to put points in everything. There is actually a reason to do that. You guys thought that some people might do it. You even exactly. thought about what kind of player that would be. And no, it was not written as idiot under the tooltip. <laughs> it was actually, this guy is an explorer. This right. guy likes to experience everything the game has to offer. This guy wants to be able to dabble in non-combat. Mm -hmm. So you actually have, I believe, the final tier of all three of your trees, you know, the, uh, the might tree and, of course, the finesse tree and the sorcery. Right. Yep. There is a class called Universalist, Destiny called Universalist, and it actually has, I believe, at the moment, bear in mind, of course, all pre alpha and things right. like that, it has a bonus to all weapons. So it's like, right. this kind of guy wants to use everything he possibly can. He's probably hoarding loot. He's probably got a giant sack over his shoulder. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think that was one of the most interesting things to me, actually, that you've, instead of telling him, no, you cannot do that, you've embraced it and said, yes, you can, and we're actually going to give you something for it, too. 
That's right. Well, it, it's been kind of the mantra for all of the decisions that the, we want the player to be able to make throughout the game. Uh, we want these really meaty player choices. So if a player is choosing whether they delve deep into one of the trees, the sorcery tree or the might tree, and get that top tier ability, we want that to be a compelling choice. But then also, we don't want that to be the only driving choice. So the person that wants to be that jack of all trades or that universalist, we want them to have a nice meaty piece. And that idea of, I can use every damn piece of loot in the game that drops is pretty compelling because there's a yeah, lot of really awesome weapons in the game. Yeah, we saw that. And also, you, uh, needless to say, have not made, you've not restricted players to simply using what drops. You do actually right. have some crafting systems within the game, particularly, I believe, blacksmithing. That's right. Which was very, very interesting indeed. Why don't you uh, tell the guys a little bit about how that works? Sure, so uh, blacksmithing is one of our three crafting systems within the game. Um, it lets you take any weapon you find in the world and based upon your skill, you're able to salvage those weapons into pieces, so blades and grips and handles, uh, things like that. And then you're able to recombine those components into another type of weapon. Yeah. So uh, say you're a rogue and you've got a bunch of points in your dagger skills or in your fey blade skills, and you're getting a lot of these seven-foot great swords dropping. Mm -hmm. um, you can break those components down and start to build the weapons that you want you to actually equip want for to your use, player. Yeah. Uh, and at the higher levels of blacksmithing, you get to make some of these master crafted items that are just really phenomenally powerful and beautiful. Um, our art team has done an amazing job of building hundreds of unique weapons. These are not weapons that have a different name and a different color, but these are weapons that have a completely different set of art. They have their own animation. We have this one awesome great sword, which actually has flesh encasing the sword and eyeballs that follow around as you're wielding. Oh, very wielding. nice. It's, it's, it's really amazing what the art team has been able to do. Yeah, and just to clarify as well, it's not all handcrafted stuff. There is actually the what I like to call the prefix suffix system right. involved in it. So if you're into a little bit of plus one of orc slaying and things like that, <laughs> you're going to get something quite similar. Uh, yeah, so we, we do have a, um, an affixing system uh, so we generate hundreds of thousands of pieces of loot, and they pull from a huge table of different art pieces as well. Uh, they also have their own shaders, depending upon their um, the strength of the weapon, the, yep. basically the, the type of weapon, whether it's a sylvanite weapon or a rusty iron weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that provides that extra granularity and that progression of the loot and the items in the world. And then when you get that big epic weapon drop, it gives that great, really meaty feeling to that. Yeah, yeah, people always like their random element because I, I think it, it's compelling. It keeps people playing because yeah. they don't know what's around the corner. Exactly. And of course, when they do get something that's fantastic, they that, that gives them the extra bit of excitement right. there. So that's very, very nicely put together indeed. Now, that's not to say that the focus of the game is merely combat, however. Correct. We did see some dialogue, some well voiced Scottish gnomish dialogue <laughs> and you do of course have choices and indeed not just dialogue choices we're also talking about things like non-combat skills as well Correct. so uh, actually marrying that those two things the non-combat skills and dialogue uh, one of our non-combat skills is persuasion yeah um, and so that allows you to sometimes take different paths through a dialogue tree uh, solve a quest in a manner uh, outside of combat, potentially using persuasion to get someone to do something that you want them to do mm -hmm. instead of beating them in the face uh, to get them to do it. Um, it also lets you get greater rewards sometimes from the quest givers or uh, demand your payment up front, for yeah. example. Um, some of the other non-combat skills that we have, we have Detect Hidden, which lets you find secret doors throughout the world, uh, see chests, actually even get to see um, uh, enemy ambushes around the corner yeah. before you get to them. At the higher levels of Detect Hidden, you can even see traps. And what you can then do is you can dismantle those traps into their component parts and use those pieces in your crafting system. So whether it's in your sage crafting, uh, which lets you craft gems, or in your blacksmithing skills. Okay. Now, I didn't notice any over-morality system within the game. No, uh, we're not you know those those morality systems can fit really well with certain games uh sometimes we feel they limit the player's ability to make a choice okay so uh 
we didn't want players to feel like they either had to be good or had to be bad to get that bonus at the right. end. Yeah. Uh, we want our players to have choice at all points. So okay. that kind of moral ambiguity and allow them to at times be a jerk and at times be the hero. Yeah, so, when appropriate, yeah. but it's not going to have these far-reaching consequences of a bar moving backwards and forwards. Like, I don't want to make this decision because it might put five points here. And yeah, I, I suppose it takes the mechanical element out of it and it makes it, it, it's a more organic experience. Sometimes there is uh, someone who's just a, a total uh, Jerk, Total douchebag, and, and, and you, you, you want to treat him as you such. You just want to waste him. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to be able to do that. And I assume while while that stuff will have consequences, of course, in yeah. certain areas, it's not going to be in the case of a bar going back and forward. So. Correct. But we have we do have certain faction lines that yes, have you do. Uh, multiple endings depending upon the way that you treat the people right. within the faction. Okay. Um, and that's an important choice. So how you want to be seen at the end of the faction or... There are even quests where you have multiple options of the ways that you approach it. So yeah. um, there's one quest in the world where you have to get rid of a, a lord of a castle. And you have an option of doing it in a stealthy manner and having people not know that it was you. The town then thinks every, everything is great with you and you're fine and okay. you weren't the cause of this. Right. Or you can overtly just assassinate the guy. You come back into the town and they understand you were the one that killed him directly. They're not really happy with you. Right, yeah. You did mention a crime system as well in that regard. Yeah, you do support the picking of pockets and the wasting of fools. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So. Um, we allow players to commit crimes within the world, whether it's stealing directly from NPCs or sneaking into someone's houses, picking the lock of their door and opening their uh, chests of uh, belongings and yep. taking them. Of course, uh, if someone sees you doing that, you can be caught. And if the guards come and apprehend you, you have a couple options. Uh, you can try to resist arrest, which will instantly take you into combat with those guards. Uh, that can sometimes be uh, very dangerous, especially in some of the larger cities. Um, you can also decide to pay a fine, uh, and that's one of the ways where your persuasion skill would come into hand. Okay. You could uh, potentially bribe the guards yep. um, to get away, or you can actually go to jail. And this is where you would physically be moved to a jail in the area where you were caught. And then you could try to, for example, pick the pocket of the guard and get the key, or pick the lock of the jail and try to get out, or fight your way out. And okay. those all have different consequences depending upon what you do, as well as the skills that you have uh, built into your stealth. Yeah, for so it's kind of like an active time-based punishment for doing something wrong if you screw up and get caught, but you can make use of your skills to shorten the time in jail as opposed to paying a fine or indeed just fighting on the street. Correct, but uh, sometimes like if you go into a city and you murder someone and are caught and put into jail, if you don't spend your time in the jail, you don't take your, uh, your penalty there and you break out, if you get too close to those city guards, they're going to remember you and remember that uh -huh. you broke out and yeah. try to apprehend you again. Okay, stop right there, criminal scum. Yeah. Sounds really good to me. And I think that actually pretty much covers almost everything. It's sounding like a very, very detailed game. And you were saying that the amount of content within the game that you're sort of aiming for, including things like the faction quests and the side quests, is it's certainly beyond, it's around kind of a beyond 100 hours-ish. Oh, it's well, take. it's well beyond Well beyond hours, that, yeah. <laughs> you were saying your playtesters yeah, have, have been yeah, locked in there for a while. Yes, we have some playtesters that have over 300 hours into uh, trying to finish all the content in the game. So um, it's a rather uh, ambitious uh, game that we've built. And, um, you know, we're, we're really thrilled with the results. Uh, I think that... Uh, we probably wouldn't have tried to make this big of a game if we knew how uh, difficult it was, but we're really excited to get it into the hands of the consumer. Well, you're called Big Huge Games for a reason, and ambition has always kind of been on your agenda. Like, yes. Well, we could make an RTS, or we could make one that spans history and <laughs> all the way over that or anything like that. So it's great to see you guys on this, of course, with Studio 38 and with uh, Kurt Schilling and the fantastic partners that you have great. with this game. And I say, well, I have had hands on. We can't show you it. I'm looking forward to you guys actually getting to see it, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, because it is, even in its pre-alpha state, really good. Uh, anyone that's a fan of either RPGs or indeed things like Spectacle Fighters or both, if you happen to be a sane and sensible person, I think you're going to enjoy this one. Kingdoms of Amala Reckoning, and thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Total Biscuit, and I will see you next time.